Um, my paper takes um, the Vimeo archive of the Syrian Film Collective Abu Nadara as a case study to address ethical issues that permit the presentation of openly accessible online archives in, um, in the context of art exhibitions, particularly um, archives that pertain to conflict and violence. And I want to approach this topic from a very self-reflective perspective that I hope to also carry into the roundtable afterwards um, to question patterns of recognition and representation that actually might reproduce the very power structures um, we try to criticize. So, um, yeah. Uh, I also just want to mention, especially for everyone who's joining online, that they have some blank black slides in the, in the presentation. It's not a mistake. Um, so, in the wake of the 2011 Arab uprisings, the widespread hope in the democratic potential of the digital generated numerous crowdsourced archival initiatives that set out to challenge authority over historiography and memory commanded by state institutions as well as global news networks. Yet, while the internet has enabled recording, sharing, and archiving these revolts in an unprecedented fashion, they also instituted a globally dispersed reinforcement of power, turning memory and knowledge into commodified and copyrighted goods. As Donatella de la Rata argues, the online platforms that enabled the emergence of such counter archives also lodged them in informational economies that inflect their liberatory potential and render dissenting subjects and documents vulnerable to various forms of power." End quote. Against this background, as researchers, curators, archivists, artists, and viewers, it is essential to develop practices of engagement that can respond to the growing demands and responsibilities inherent in new media art archives of conflict and violence. Violence never becomes explicitly visible, but resonates through this two-minute video interview by the Syrian film collective Abu Nadara. The boy pre presumably sits in a schoolyard, his name and location remain unknown. With great enthusiasm, he begins to recount how he and his friends started shouting revolutionary slogans in class and organizing demonstrations at school. When they joined the revolution, as he puts it, they started playing tricks like placing banana skins in the pathways of pro-regime teachers and performing subversive gestures like burning the portrait of Bashar al-Assad. But with the increasing militarization of the Syrian conflict and the transition from uprising to civil war, the boy's involvement also becomes more violent and dangerous. He boasts of his knowledge of weapons and his, ex his experience with guns. The whole conversation is repeatedly drowned by the noise of gunfire and the sound of an approaching engine, which prompts the camera to pan upwards and nervously scan the sky. The boy assures the interviewer that there is nothing to worry about. Just before the engine roar swells and the image cuts off with the sound of an airstrike, the video is titled The End of School. Since its foundation in Damascus in 2017, an undisclosed number of volunteer self-taught filmmakers have gathered in the collective Abu Nadara to produce short videos which are freely accessible on the platform Vimeo. The name Abu Nadara translates to the man with glasses, both a hint towards seeing clearly and a reference to Ziga Vertov's man with a movie camera. Violence rarely becomes explicitly visible, but resonates in conversations with commonplace protagonists, as well as through collages of news broadcasts and archival footage. By appropriating the aesthetic and formal language of documentary film, Abu Nadara seeks to make visible everyday life amidst the Syrian conflict and on the roots of refuge and migration. One such video is Children of Halfaya, in this video too, the main protagonist is a boy who talks about his experiences in the war in Syria and in exile in Lebanon. In Syria, he and his brothers and sisters went to school until the school was destroyed by a bomb attack. The camera zooms out and focuses on the other children of the family, looking both excitedly and embarrassedly into the camera. Gradually, the living, the living conditions become apparent as they are housed in a refugee tent with mattresses, blankets, and rugs gathered around a central stove. The camera focuses on the boy again as he begins to talk about the breadline massacre, through which his hometown, Halfaya, just a few kilometers north of Hama, attained tragic fame. 
On 23rd of December 2012, about 300 civilians were killed in an airstrike as they were waiting in line for bread. It is one of the most documented targeted attacks on civilians by the Assad regime. The Breadline massacre became the focus of media attention. Remembering how he witnessed the massacre on television and on cell phones, a spark of pride enters the boy's face and gruesome account, a remnant of the expectations and hopes attached to the documentation of war crimes by citizen journalists. Abu Nadera's films are the antithesis of the amateur footage from the Syrian conflict, which is characterized by shaky camera work, low resolution, poor sound quality, and the depiction of a moment of intense violence or emotion. The economy of news gathering and instrumentalization of citizen journalism that went hand in hand with the militarization of the Syrian conflict. Through the display of an increasing level of violence and suffering, and I quote Abu Nadara, the Syrian has been transformed from a dignified revolutionary into a victim who provokes only sorrow or disgust, end quote. Accordingly, this has led to an unprecedented banalization of evil that leaves the audience barely a choice between indifference and compassionate voyeurism. As self-proclaimed artisans of cinema, the collective is very consciously practicing a type of careful, considered narrative that privileges storytelling over information. Abu Nadara asserts that if Syrian image makers want to reinstate the dignity of their compatriots, they must seize the means of production of their own image." End quote. Yet, a that was too fast. Yet, Syrian citizen journalists who filmed and shared their footage online, firmly believing in the distributed ownership of digital networks, later had to realize that they were no longer keepers of their own images. As soon as the revolutionary moment faded away, the revolutionary commons also was also exposed to disruption and looting. The Syrian image was highly commodified and sought after by corporate and private actors from broadcasting stations to NGOs, art galleries, and film festivals. In this image economy, Abu Nadara constructed a digital archive to collect and preserve memory by way of building a different narrative, one that stands in opposition to that of the dictatorial regime and the news industry. Thus, ownership, authorship, and authority are key concerns for Abu Nadara's work. However, in 2017, the Triennale Milano featured Abu Nadara's video art archive as part of the exhibition La Terra Inquieta, The Restless Earth, even though the collective, the collective had explicitly declined this invitation. Their refusal was grounded in the fact that the collective considered the Triennale's focus on Syrian migrants and refugees as opportunistic and did not want the work, quote, to be subsumed under a politico-aesthetic discourse which privileges a Western point of view, end quote. Nevertheless, the Triennale presented video loops of Abu Nadara's work on three screens, including the two videos I showed at the beginning, The End of School and Children of Halfaya. When the collective became aware of this through press reviews, they asked for video screens to be removed, a request that was only granted after public outcry. Curator Massimiliano Gianni insisted that the exhibition simply made available monitors connected to Abu Nadara's Vimeo archive, which was already in the public domain anyways. While Johnny acknowledged the ways in which Abu Nadara reframes issues of author authorship and distribution, he questioned their position on maintaining control over the videos, and I quote him, that is more restrictive than their own work would seem to suggest, end quote. As a consequence, Abu Nadara decided to take their entire Vimeo archive offline. To this neglect of authorship and abuse of copyright by the Triennale, the film collective could not resign, quote, except to renounce our fight for the right to the image. Following this incident, so Abu Nadara in an interview, we realized that the aesthetic struggle could not succeed without questioning the regime of representation in a juridical sense as well. In their 2014 concept paper for the coming revolution, Abu Nadara claims a right to the dignified image, a transnational civil protection that the collective wishes to see amended to the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Image rights for Abu Nadara are not aesthetic abstractions or artistic provocations, but concrete ethical concerns and legal realities. 
They argue that the right to the image is not a single right, but rather a bundle of rights, including the right to self-determination, the right to privacy, the right to freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. Underlying the collective's conceptualization of the right to the dignified image is the claim for an alternative socio-economic system whose mainstream media would not depend on economic profit. It advocates a media that does not represent by either economic or ideological necessity some lives and bodies is more inclined to injury or death so as to maximize their currency as sensationalism. The collective demands that, quote, a balance of power must be constructed <coughs> that allows Syrians to re-establish their own image separate from the political and media powers that seek to represent them. To achieve this, there should be a public debate about the invulnerability of the body and the right to self-determination in this media age. Essentially, the case of Abu Nadara serves as a mirror image of our representational apparatus, extending the hegemonic viewing patterns that underlie global news networks to international exhibition circuits. Thus, the Triennale reproduced the very power structures it sought to criticize reflecting the processes that perpetuate spectacles of indignity and that fold us as global viewers into complicity with conflict and violence. I cannot purport to occupy a position outside of this digital sensorium that makes such patterns of viewing possible. Liberal societies are sustained by an uneven distribution of pain between those who suffer and those who are solicited to redress that suffering. Christina Sharp argues that the circulation and repetition of images of violence, as well as their formalization in art practices, do, do not lead to a cessation of violence, but often work to solidify and perpetuate the colonial project of violence. She urges us as distant viewers to think about what these images call forth, to think through what they call on us to do and to feel, and, we, and how we might be able to refuse the positions that these cruel images solicit. The technologies of war connect us across the globe through virtual networks and everyday digital environments and create infrastructural proximities. In many ways, by liking, sharing, tapping on our screens, we are in relations of touch with others, with our touch having very real consequences, even with those who cannot touch us back. Now more than ever are we in relationships of moral, affective and material intimacy with distant conflict and violence to the extent that we are always embedded and sensorially implicated in the cruel images they convey. This is to say that our relationship to conflict and violence goes beyond the question of seeing or looking away. In an intensely and extensively mediated global world, we are always in relation with these images, even if we do not see them. To challenge hegemonic and algorithmic infrastructures of knowledge production and dissemination, a still growing number of crowdsourced archival initiatives from the 2011 Arab uprisings claim the right to intervene in and act upon the reservoirs of collective memory. The space of image production and reception can expose epistemological gaps in digital and datafied repositories, centralize what has been abstracted, and reconfigure what counts as an archive. By doing so, we can imagine new forms of accountability from within the aesthetic field. This prompts us to reconsider our spectatorial positionality in archival agency. As viewers who look and listen, like and share, we, we can hide behind neither the, neither the screens in which we watch, nor the excuse that the recording was already out there. In looking, in listening, in liking and sharing, we are complicit. Thus, we need to ask, what are we looking at or listening to? How are we being asked to look and to listen? And is this a position we wish to take up? In other words, how can we develop an ethical practice vis-a-vis -vis the subjects who are inscribed in such archival recordings? And these are some of the questions that I want to take into the roundtable discussion that I'm going to moderate now with uh, Natalia. So, thank, thank you. you.